Hello, and welcome to the Vineyard View. I'm your host, Ann Bassett, coming to you from MVTV, community television here on Martha's Vineyard Island. Today, my guest is Dr. Lisa Naj. She is a specialist in environmental medicine. In other words, everything that's around us. And she's going to talk about the toxins that are around us all the time and how we are affected. She also does emergency medicine. She's going to talk about her practice, and she's going to give us some tips on things that we need to know. Dr. Lisa? Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for that gracious introduction. I guess I'm trying to figure out what would be interesting to discuss today for people on the vineyard, since this is a show for people on the vineyard. I have a, um, a mission. I'm trying to educate the country about environmental medicine and how useful it is in almost all chronic diseases. Change medical school education to teach med students in the first year a little bit of this information so they can choose whether they want to incorporate it into their practice. I went to Penn undergraduate and I went to Cornell for medical school and at Penn Med they invited me to come and give a talk, like a two-hour talk on what is environmental medicine, what's the history of it. So I'll say at the beginning and some, somebody may not be able to watch our whole program but I have a website where this video is available and the website is my name so it's Lisa Nagy, you know N-A-G-Y which is Naj or Nagy, dot com and they can go to that, click on the Penn Med video, and then see sort of in a slow, descriptive way where environmental medicine has been over the last 50 years and where it's going in the future and what have been the stumbling blocks. So if I can continue, what I think is important is to say what's going on in the vineyard, how could environmental medicine or integrative medicine help people here? And I come to you know, thinking of things that are really obvious problems with alcoholism, in adults and maybe children and or teenagers and the epidemic of ADD and you know related to autism and what's wrong with teenagers in high school who are gravitating towards stimulants whether they get a prescription stimulant for ADD or whether they're drinking coca-cola they need to have uh, marijuana or uh, drinking alcohol or borrowing other people's ADD medication because they're medicating environmentally induced dysautonomia and I'll explain what that is but it makes them slouchy lazy feeling like they can't stand up and like they can't get the blood into their head and stay awake so I don't know if that interests you but does that seem like a couple of subjects we should start oh, with? Oh yes maybe? please please this is your platform so it seems that Anne understands a lot about environmental medicine, which amazes me because, you know, in general, we've had trouble with the level of the AMA and the Mass Medical Society to change policy to say that environmental medicine has utility, but also that looking at chronic diseases, uh, piecing together the reasons that people have the chronic disease is the way to go to save billions in healthcare dollars. So if you take this issue with children at high school, now, I don't have a child in high school, but I do understand that there's an issue with addiction and with uh, fatigue syndromes and with learning problems and obviously with ADD because the incidence of ADD is so high now. So if we look at a child who has exposure to something like a uh, moldy basement at the house or moldy school classroom, then they will have mild environmental illness or even severe so. So if you have mild environmental illness, you may notice that you get headaches or that you're tired or that you have um, fatigue in the morning, you can't get up, and, uh, or f fatigue at four in the afternoon. So what happens is that the adrenal function can be damaged by the mold exposure. So the adrenals are the little glands here hmm. on top of the kidneys. They make cortisol, which makes you get up in the morning, feel great, you know, have the energy to read and run and do interaction in a friendly way. If your cortisol is low, you feel depressed, you feel angry if somebody gets in your face and you're irritated by them. So we measure cortisol in people, in the saliva, the urine, and the blood. Hmm. If somebody has mold exposure or pesticide exposure to a high enough extent, or solvents, or some chemical that's really bringing them down, they can get damage also to the nervous system besides the endocrine system. So the brain stem is here, goes down to the spinal cord, and the nerves go out to the legs. If the nerves going to the legs aren't working well, you have a neuropathy, the veins will dilate, they won't be constricted, and the blood is like hanging out in your legs and you feel like lead legs. Hmm. You won't want to get up, you start to fold your arms, you can cross your legs or even pretzel them where you wrap them like a pretzel, and you just feel like you need a Coca-Cola. 
because when you drink Coca-Cola, the caffeine will help to constrict the veins in the legs and keep the blood in the head. Otherwise, the blood is sinking down low and you feel kind of wiped out. And you may slouch in your chair, to, like in a movie. After you sit for a while, you need to get the blood in your head and it doesn't go because you're sitting up so high. So we, you know, we can lie down. So I see this commonly in people and teenagers who lean on the wall. So you can tell when you look at people, if they tend to fold their arms or lean on the wall, they may have this postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, POTS. And I send people to Beth Israel for a tilt table to see if they have POTS. But what happens is, with tilt table or not, you don't have to have one, you medicate the person with midodrine and maybe Florinaf, and these are medications and a hormone to help keep the veins and the legs constricted so they don't need the stimulant. My, my. So I don't know if I've been boring, <laughs> but the idea no. is you don't need an Adderall or a ADD medication to speed up the brain function and make the person a functional human being. You need the blood in the brain with the oxygen that it brings. So yes, midodrine is a drug that's doing the constriction, but midodrine doesn't go into the brain. And it's just affecting the legs and the veins and the gut. Whereas so the ADD medicine is straight going into the brain. Uh -huh. Okay, and it's giving you other things and it's addictive, you know, potentially addictive. Stimulants like cocaine are obviously addictive. So cigarettes, Coca-Cola, co cocaine, you know, all of these things really can bring somebody's life down because you can spend a lot of money on cigarettes or cocaine and then you become the addictive personality, which everything you try to do is getting money to get your drug. You know, and if your children, if your parents don't want to buy you cigarettes and you like to smoke, then you're, you know, your cigarettes are too expensive now to like ignore the price. <laughs> yes. So when I last smoked, it was 50 cents a pack. You know, it was like 35 years ago or something. And I'm old enough, I can say 35 years for anything. So this is a fascinating, you know, I'm trying to do a screenplay in a movie and bring out this fact that part of the problem with society is that people are becoming environmentally ill to a mild to moderate extent in large percentages. So 40% of the population is mildly affected. 15% of the population is moderately affected. They know that they are sensitive to chemicals, they've got fatigue, they don't like moldy places, they can't handle traveling on an airplane because of the close quarters and the recirculated air and all the people with their perfume. So people who don't like to fly are environmentally ill. By nature, you know, this is by definition. So if we were to be able to talk about why does the medical community not believe these conditions if it's so common? Why do we think ADD is so common or autism is becoming more common? And now they know it's not all genetics. So they know right, it's environmental, right. right? Well, what I'm seeing is on PBS documentaries, newspapers every day, I'm seeing something about the toxins that are around us all the time and the toxins that are sprayed on vegetables and fruits, et cetera that are, are in our bodies. I, can you test what's in our bodies? Oh yeah, so we can test. Sometimes insurance doesn't pay for the testing for chemicals or mold toxins or metals, but people can do, some of the tests are inexpensive. Sometimes it's worth it if they're sick for them to pay for the testing. But we measure solvents, PCBs, phthalates, pesticides, and you will be surprised. I can't tell who's filled with toluene and benzene from their work. They could be painting on a cleaner for wiring if they're an electrician. Yes. Or they could be doing a painting job and they could be taking off leaded paint and that will give them a high lead level in the blood. But sometimes even a chelation challenge where you give a drip and then they urinate for six hours and you collect all these metals in the urine. Oh, wow. And from fillings, from amalgam fillings. Now, why dentists still want to insist that amalgams which have been used inappropriately, now we're making people sick, it's a big conflict of interest because amalgam has been supported by the dental society. All the dentists were trained to think that it's okay. But if you're sick and you have multiple sclerosis and you get your teeth fixed and get your fillings out and you feel better and then your MS improves, why not let people pursue this? Because it really does have not just anecdotal information in the literature, but there are published studies about um, things like MS having higher mycotoxin levels, chronic fatigue having higher mold toxin levels in the urine than normal patients. So these things are in the literature, but your average general practitioner just doesn't read this kind of literature, let alone keeping up with 
what's important in their practice, like how to use a high blood pressure medication or an antidepressant. The next level is to read how to really fix the person so they don't need the antidepressant or the anti-anxiety drug. Now, if we can talk about anxiety for a minute, but, but I just have to say, <laughs> this is what we're, we're seeing all the time in the medical profession, and, and even if we love our doctors, we are seeing that symptoms are being treated without anybody looking at the cause, the underlying cause for the symptom. You must see this all the time. Right. And I think that you have to realize that it takes a couple hours to do a first appointment with a patient, getting to this discussion of what did you do when you were a child, where did you live, what kind of jobs have you had, what kind of hobbies, did you do photography, have you been exposed, exposed to photographic chemicals. There are so many different things to ask and insurance doesn't pay for those minutes of asking about your environmental exposures. Then when you come back and you want to discuss how you are feeling with your management, there is no payment for that hour. Insurance pays in segments that are much shorter now. Right. So right. the problem is, is that the, the, the vision is short-sighted. If insurance companies cared if people were not disabled and not sick and not on a medication and not in the hospital, they would promote getting to the cause of a disease. Mm, yes. Like causation I, medicine. It just seems, just seems like common, common sense. Yeah. I also uh, wanted to ask you, I, I have a friend who has a persistent, dry, hollow cough when she's in her house. Hmm. When she gets out of the house and into the car, she seems to be fine. Now, can she be tested to see what is in her blood? And then, how does her house get tested? Well, that's the thing. The first thing to do is to do a mold plate at the house. So you could just take these little plates from P&K Microbiology. You order 10 of them, put them in the refrigerator, and then when they come, you open them each, outside, in each room, and then after an hour, you cover them. And then you watch them grow for five days. And then you decide Whoa. which one, <laughs> so which one's growing a mold that doesn't look like it's from outside. It should be the same molds as outside and a lower amount inside. So if you've got a mold that's black inside the house, and you've got 10 colonies growing, and you've got no black ones outside, then you know there's a source for the black colonies, and you want to know, is it Stachybotrys, is it Aspergillus niger, which one is it? And then you can look up your mold, put in the word toxin, and it'll tell you, does it make toxins? And then if you're interested, you can measure the toxins at real-time labs in the urine through your doctor, not your traditional doctor. So right. that's the thing, is that right. the traditional doctor could do it, but doesn't have these kits in the office where you say, take this kit home, urinate, and then put it in the tube. And the interesting thing is I discovered about this mold toxin issue, because we'll get back to your friend's cough, but the mold toxins are stored in the fat. If you do a sauna and then do your urine sample an hour later, the mold toxins go up by five or ten times. Hmm. So the yield for the test is much better if you do the sauna, although it'll be artificially higher, but it won't be zero. So if you do this test and you get all zeros, you'll think, oh, I have no toxins, but really the sauna may make it evident that you're missing the diagnosis. Oh so I discovered this. This is actually research that I'd like to publish. So I did about 20 patients before sauna and then an hour or two later after the sauna, the same day. My And goodness. then you go from zero to positive. So one, it tells you you can get a better yield on the test and diagnosis. And two, it tells you that sauna is therapeutic and sauna will get your toxins out. And the mold toxins are one example. We've measured heavy metals in people's sweat. So it comes out in the sauna. And also these solvents and other toxins that we've stored for decades from just being people will come out, but not only in the sweat, it'll come out into the bloodstream. You know, it kind of melts out of the fat into the bloodstream. So the levels in the blood will go up. The liver will see it and process it and take and package all your toxins and put it into the stool so you get rid of it. You can take charcoal and uh, binders like clay mm -hmm. and drink it and that will help to bind it and bring more into the stool so that the toxins eventually leave your fatty tissue and go into the toilet. <laughs> so there's something you can do. Yes, yeah, so it's not hopeless. But the thing is, you don't want to do sauna on your own. Because if, ah. you're, yeah, if you're toxic and you do the sauna, you can end up becoming exhausted for many days and you can be wiped out. So we start with sauna five, 10 minutes at 150 degrees and then every third day we do it. And then if you're okay, we go to every second day and then we go to every day. And we work up to about 30 minutes to 60 minutes every time. Wow. 
So if you take the binders, do the sauna, you've measured what's in you beforehand, then you can measure again in six months or whatever to see if whatever thing was high, you've now removed. The brain and the spinal cord are lipid-based and fatty so that these are where the toxins are often stored, giving you neurologic problems. So if somebody has a neurologic disease, and if it happens to be worse because they've got heavy metals or mold toxins, if you take the toxins out, then the neurologic problem may improve. And if it's autoimmune, they're making antibodies to their nervous system, it may also improve because you're decreasing the stimulus for the autoantibody production. Well, now, I find this fascinating because I have a friend who has, for most of her adult life, she has a medical degree. Every week or 10 days, she has a day of fasting, drinking nothing but Vichy water, taking hot baths, and wrapping herself up in quilts because she says she can eliminate a lot of toxins in her body by doing that. What do you think? There's a published study that actually describes the utility of fasting and giving people longer life. And it's obviously what we do in environmental medicine to start off somebody's treatment. We've been using, or I've been taught, the masters in the past, Dr. Randolph, writes about fasting somebody for four days, just using glass bottled water, mm -hmm. not plastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they do bring in foods, they may want to bring in one food at a time if they've been sick to see how they react to each food and they make notes. Oh, so I ate a bagel, my. made me sick. I ate mangoes, I was okay. I ate lamb, I'm pretty good. And then you can go, I ate chocolate cookies, ooh, big headache. So you take a, you know, you have this list and you may forget, but that if you've get, got it written down. Journal. Right, you can journal and yes. find out, okay, I'm okay with blueberries, but raspberries make me sick. And then you take out the foods that are giving somebody trouble, and then you have a diet that's with foods they can tolerate. We don't notice our food allergies or sensitivities, these are more sensitivities, because we eat them all the time. But if you go off a food that you're sensitive to for four days, and then you test it on the fifth day, you'll notice your sensitivity. And everybody wow. can do that at home. I'll allow them you know, to do that without <laughs> risk. Um, but the other thing I was saying in terms of percentages is that 5% of the population is disabled from being environmentally ill or what we call chemically sensitive. So it's a huge proportion of the population and still if you go to your physician here on the vineyard or anywhere else most doctors don't know anything about chemical sensitivity and if you start describing symptoms of being sensitive to foods or sensitive to your house or feeling sick at the mall, not liking the detergent aisle of the grocery store, the diesel from the boat makes you not feel well. Many people that I see don't like getting on the boat because of the diesel and I give them a charcoal mask to wear. But what do we do with physicians to educate them about this is what's happening with real people and until the physician himself or herself gets symptoms, they don't buy into it and they think we have a like a psychiatric problem. This is illuminating. I spent a couple of weeks with a friend in California and she's very careful about what she eats. And I mentioned that I eat an apple every day. And she said, mm, too many chemicals on apples. I would switch to a different fruit if I were you. And she listed some fruits that are raised with less chemicals. I switched from milk, because I wanted to get rid of dairy, to almond milk. And she said, oh, they lots of pesticides in almonds. And they're depleting the water table in a great deal of California. They're now drilling down as f the distance of the height of the Empire State Building they're depleting, water. the. there's going to be a desert there. Nobody's going to be able to live there in another few years. All of that is water for almond trees. But now, see, what, this what, is what, frightening. My feeling, <laughs> my feeling is that if I have a patient who's sick and they have like a neurologic problem and they got tremor or they can't think and they can't spell and they can't read, I'm not so worried about the water table and the almond trees right now. I'm worried as a physician about your health. Right. So organic is the way to go because then you won't have pesticides. Right. Those chemicals will be removed if you eat or drink organic. So almond milk, even some people do okay with soy milk or some people do okay with goat's milk. It has less casein. Mm -hmm. Right. Those are better than dairy for somebody who's dairy sensitive. But a lot of my patients are addicted to ice cream. They're eating ice cream every <laughs> night. So you, you want to go for the lowest hanging fruit and say, okay, if the, if the food allergy test we do for IgG foods says that you're making a lot of antibody to dairy and gluten or string beans or baker's yeast and brewer's yeast are very big and you'd want to take those out of the diet for a while and bring them in just once every four days after you've been off for a few weeks or months that may make the person feel better and less hungover in the morning if they eat like a 
a Pop-Tart or a muffin or something, they may wake up in the morning feeling exhausted. And if they don't eat that, they may feel better. So they can look and see how they feel the morning after they've had a dinner with these foods. But not everybody has to go off dairy. Not everybody has to right. go off gluten. So we do a test for gluten sensitivity. Or we do a, a trial of being off dairy and going back on for one dose of glass of milk. And if they don't feel well or get diarrhea, <laughs> then, sorry to mention that on the TV. No, but, but that, you know, that's how you figure it out. Is, this is how you figure it out. And they say nobody over the age of two should be drinking milk anymore. It's really not, it's true. not the best thing. Um, and, and the other issue, you know, is GMO. So I was... Um, GMO? GMO is genetically modified food, oh, you know, foods yes. or organisms. And I was uh, testifying at the Medical Society a couple of days ago on whether we should have labeling for GMO foods. And it's obvious that some people would like to avoid genetically modified foods and would like to eat organic or not organic, but not GMO. So there's this gray area right. in between. And so the Medical Society voted against it, as they did the year before, unwisely, because the population wants labeling. Connecticut, and I believe Vermont and New Hampshire, have voted yes to label. They're waiting for a fourth state. Our state hasn't decided. I went to the state house. We had 270 people on the side of labeling, and I was the one physician who showed up for this you know, testimony. And then we had one person who showed up uh, in uh, favor of GMO, um, you know, foods and not labeling them. And that was a person who was not even from Monsanto, but just a person who was uh, employed in the food industry. So you can see the population is well-educated about this, but yet the physicians in the medical society state the AMA has looked at this policy. There is no data that GMOs make you feel ill. Therefore, we will not even let you know if your corn and your soy is GMO or not. So 90% of these foods are GMO. This is Part of what I find interesting here is that I have some dear friends who are doctors, and one of the things that they say right up front is the AMA does not represent me. But they should go to the AMA <laughs> and be represented, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the whole point, is that people who have a little activism in their blood or want to change the world, they have to go to the mic. You have to speak your mind and try to persuade really? your colleagues that they don't know enough and you educate them. And then you, when it you comes to a vote, they will hopefully vote in the right direction. But people at the Mass Medical Society do not spend hours researching each of the resolutions. So they see a resolution, they look at the author of the resolution. If the author looks brilliant and trustworthy, they will vote for that resolution because they're going mostly on their impression. Hmm. And then if they have a preconceived notion about mm -hmm. pesticides, bah humbug, they don't care about pesticides, then right. they may vote. Counterintuitive to what's healthy. So the problem with the GMO foods, which the people in the medical society do not understand, is that it permits the use of pesticides at a much higher rate. Did you know this? I'm, I'm reeling. Okay. I'm sitting here reeling. Sorry, I'm talking very quickly. But <laughs> no, but, no, but you're, you're giving us real information that we need to have. Well, this is nationally, this is going to be a big problem because Europe doesn't allow GMO foods that I know of you know, at all. And uh, pigs won't eat GMO corn and soy. You know, they, won't, they refuse it. It's called food refusal. So really? if, yeah, if an animal knows, maybe we should trust, trust the animals who can sense it when they taste it or smell it. <laughs> and yet, when you say Monsanto, we've all seen the current movie that's been out and read the newspaper articles that Monsanto will have a GMO farmer growing. The farmer next door doesn't want the pollinization will cross-pollinate and yep. Monsanto will then sue that farmer and put them out of business. This is outrageous. Why, yeah. why are people talking about this? Where, where are the headlines? Well, we really need to have activity congressionally. You know, the population has to affect change in the, the legal system and have laws that are, you know, changing the policies that we've allowed in the door. What they say is that the FDA has found no problem, but nobody's paid for research adequately in this country. All the research is in Europe or on animals. And the research that's in this movie and a book called Genetic Roulette, it's all about um, GMO foods and it was produced by Jeffrey Smith. Thank you very much for making the movie and the book. And he has a lot of data about why there's a problem with the GMO foods. So GMO produces a toxin called BT toxin. We eat it, the BT toxin becomes part of us, it makes us sick. Number two, you, can, you have Roundup ready uh, corn, then you can spray more Roundup to kill the weeds surrounding it because the corn can handle the pesticide. Oh, 
That's the God. whole. That's that's what's genetically modified. Then you know to to ha handle pesticides. Oh. So then you apply more pesticide, and when you eat the vegetable, it is then laden with pesticide, and the level of pesticide goes up in the person. They become more environmentally ill, less tolerant of other toxins because their barrel is full with the toxins that they've gotten from you know, the, the application on the GMO food. And some people have cross reactions with allergies. So you can, yes. you can eat a GMO product like soy and then become allergic to soy, but it can cross react with either yourself and develop an autoimmune disease or with mm. another food and make you sensitive to foods you weren't sensitive to before, but you have no idea that it's because you drink soda with corn syrup with GMO corn. So mm. we all have a lot of uh, exposure to GMO in the food chain now because of the corn syrup. You know, so if you drink one of the sodas that has sugar, then you won't have the exposure to the corn syrup. Or if you make your own beverage at home, you know, with lemon juice and a, with that machine, soda stream. It, it's very complicated to avoid everything, but when you become sick, they're just rules. And I had a conversation with somebody today about how do you get well? You can't come to a practitioner like me and fix your hormones and fix your dysautonomia and fix your nutritional problems and do oral or intravenous vitamins in order to get well unless you stop the exposure. Right. So the main issue, if you have a mold exposure or exposure at a, a workplace with the diesel exhaust fumes coming in or you pump you know, oil and gas and you're breathing it in, you have to stop the exposure and you may have to change your job where some people become disabled and can't work. So mm. if their clothes are filled with the smell of gasoline, they may have to get fresh clothes. Or their moldy clothes from the house may be unwashable. Oh. So not everybody on the vineyard has to leave their house and get new clothes. But the people who come to me from around the country who are trying to heal from very bad illness, they walk away from their moldy clothes, they get fresh clothes, and they try to heal in a clean environment. So we have some housing that we provide for people to stay in if they want to live in a clean environment with filtered air and you know, oak or marble flooring so that they have a decreased exposure in air, food, and water. We fix all of that, and then the person starts to improve in that first week. It's fascinating to watch people who've been sick for 10 or 20 years improve you know, that quickly. And, wow. and, and then they may take a couple of months to really get stronger, and then again, a couple of years to get all the way well and I'm not saying everybody with Lou Gehrig's is going to live, but a lot of these diseases are um, treatable if you get them early. So they thought I had a Lou Gehrig's picture. My husband had a Parkinson's picture and had tremor and, and uh, three autoimmune diseases. And now off of gluten, he's fine. No autoimmune disease, he's well, no tremor, no Parkinson's symptom. And I have, you know, muscle strength. I can breathe well. I used to have gasping at night I was gonna die I knew I was gonna be on a ventilator and I was gonna you know be it so now I go to the red pony and I ride my horse on a daily basis and I really have no feeling of muscle weakness or fatigue and it's great to be well but the question is what is my life going to yield is it gonna change health care is it gonna influence people to change med school education it's not really about treating like a couple of people in the office it's really about the the whole dilemma that medicine doesn't incorporate taking an environmental history and they don't know how to act on it and give advice. And it's from these old guys who treated us or taught us in the past, like Dr. Randolph and my colleague Dr. Ray and Doris Rapp, these people are in their 80s. Dr. Randolph is deceased. It's people like me who are young enough to try to carry on the torch and explain to society how do we tell medicine to revamp? And you have to back this up with testing. All right. So data is important, but you need money to do studies and data. So the problem is sometimes there's no money unless you're a pharmaceutical company giving money for a study to get the study done. And the, the work we're doing now in terms of changing government policy, I'm on a committee at NIH on building in health. And I was the opening speaker. I talked all about the history of environmental medicine and what I think, you know, the vision. And it was all about how buildings need to be changed and built better for human, not just for uh, conserving heat and saving money and fuel, but the carpeting shouldn't be toxic. The padding shouldn't outgas a chemical right. that makes us sick. And it's insane. 
that they were allowed to put chemicals in furniture, mattresses with the flame retardants, clothing with flame retardants, because of the fear of somebody burning up a house, but then we're all poisoned nationwide with these flame retardants. They're called, well, I won't get into what they're called, but you can measure them. And Linda Bierbaum, who's the head of NIEHS, has done a lot of research on the effect of flame retardants on thyroid gland. And so people in the government who are on government agencies, they know this is right. They know this is true. But there's not enough support from each congressman or each senator to, say, pass a bill. And so what we're working on now is on veterans' health because if they're very desperate to stop veterans from committing suicide. Yes. So if the government would change management and the VA would change management of veterans and we see an improvement, decrease in depression and anxiety, an improvement in overall health, then the rest of medicine could look at that as a model through the VA. They'll never do it. I'm because the it. military is the worst offender in terms of toxic chemicals. Right, except guess what? They have knowledge that the chemicals in the burning oil pits and in the, um, the um, bioterrorism agents that they were exposed to. Agent Orange. Yeah, oh, Agent Orange. And so they know the data is there. They admit it kind of now. Now, yeah, they're just beginning to admit right. but they spent so... How frustrating, how but, frustrating. But the thing is, is that Tracy Godet is one of the women, uh, she's a, a physician who's head of the Veterans uh, Sort of Integrative Medicine Program now. And she was working with Dr. Weil originally and now has moved to the VA. And we're trying to get oh. her interested in just looking at dysautonomia, looking at just this one thing in veterans. Is their heart rate faster when they stand up and slower when they lay down? Do they need a tilt table? Do they need midadrine and Florinaf? Would they benefit from some of the things we do in environmental medicine? The question is obviously yes. But if you could get them off of cigarettes, alcohol, and drugs, right, it would be beneficial. But the reason people do cigarettes and alcohol and drugs is because they have low adrenal function, low thyroid function, dysautonomia. So if you fix those three things first, if they're a problem, then they drop out the alcohol and drugs. You can't just take cigarettes away from somebody and say, here, have a good day. They can't do it. Right. It's not right. fair. So right. the alcohol issue on the island, we're coming full circle to booze. Yes. So there was a paper in the 60s written on alcoholism, and it was saying that when you have low adrenal function, low cortisol, you can't make sugar available for the cells when you have low cortisol. Alcohol is sort of a quick sugar. So you'll drink alcohol instead and when it wears off you need more alcohol so you always have to be yes. kind of drinking continuously yes, yes. I hate to interrupt you but no, and no, we'll get back to what you say but I have come to realize in my long years that people who drink are self-medicating and a lot of yeah. that reason is because they're trying to squelch pain personal pain psychological pain but now you're saying they're also trying to deal with with physical hormones. problems. Oh, yeah. And so the other thing is the oh. anxiety. I find so many men on the island are anxious. And it's people who work in the service industry, plumbers, electricians, and painters, and this kind of, they are sometimes a, a little hypomanic, you know, kind of jumpy and all around, and they speak very quickly. In my mind, if you ask them and you talk to them, in my mind, you know, they have a lot of anxiety, but they don't want to admit it. Hmm. And it can be from low DHEA. It can be from the d dysautonomia, where they're unable to stand comfortably, so the heart starts going quickly, they release adrenaline, they get ja jazzed and, 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 and nervous, and they can't relax. So if you fix this dysautonomia, or you give them a little DHEA, all of a sudden they're normal, they feel calm, and they don't need to drink alcohol right. or smoke pot for their insomnia or their anxiety in the evening. It's unbelievable. Again, treating symptoms. Right. So in, ter the, the yeah, in terms of addiction, I think it's the biggest thing in alcoholism is to look at these factors. Because if somebody could benefit from like a little testosterone or a little thyroid and a, a little sauna and not be an alcoholic, what is the harm in, let's say, community services? Working with somebody like me who offers for free to give a lecture. But people at community services even are too busy to get their head up during the day to say, yes, we're interested in having an educational program here with these basic tenets of take some vitamin B, take a little vitamin C, 
maybe go to the health club and do sauna and exercise. These are, you know, eat vegetables. A lot of people don't have any B vitamins. Don't eat vegetables. Because they I don't know. eat a vegetable. <laughs> this is why alcoholics, we tend to give in the emergency room a drip. We give B vitamins mm -hmm. because people get thiamine deficiency and may get problems, neurologic problems from being an alcoholic and B vitamin deficiency. This is well known in traditional medicine. So some of these issues really, to me, are basic, but to some of the physicians here or the hospital, it seems like I'm coming from left field and I don't make sense. But I am reiterating concepts that have been in integrative and environmental medicine for 50 years. And I'm reiterating what the rest of the country is aware of and what people on the island and you are aware of. But we don't have our hospital on board. We don't have community services on board. We don't have people wanting to learn more who could help the people on the island or nationwide. Because I've been told people are fearful you know, and insecure when they don't know a subject. They don't want to admit they don't know about nutrition. Or they don't want to do endocrinology because let's send them to the endocrinologist. But we have to take responsibility on the island and demand more of the physicians, demand communication from those people who know about integrative techniques. Acupuncture is accepted at the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it took a long time for that to happen, but why not nutritional information? Why not information about toxicity? Who wants to say for the next 50 years that mold doesn't hurt you? It's incorrect. There was a lot of data. This island, right, has the problem. Gosh, so much of what you're saying is stuff that I'm running into almost on a daily basis, certainly on Why a weekly that? basis. The hospital does have nutritionists, but one of the problems that we are now hearing is that when this country became aware of an obesity problem and everybody started, and this was like 30 years, we've got to get rid of fat, fat. we have to get rid of fat. Wrong. They replaced fats, right? Everything you do is now low fat, non fat, et cetera, but they replaced the fats with more of this corn syrup, which is just so deadly and full of empty calories. So now the obesity problem is even greater. It's carbs. So we've, re we've changed we've our changed. mind from fats to carbs are bad. Right. So what carbs do, like rice, potatoes, bread, is they make you release insulin. Your sugar goes up when you eat the carb. Yep. Then your insulin goes up to bring the sugar down. Sugar goes down, the insulin stays up. Your cells don't respond because you're so used to releasing a lot of insulin. So you release more insulin. It's called insulin resistance. In men, giving testosterone helps it. Helps really? diabetes. Oh yeah, helps diabetes and helps insulin resistance. You can use hmm. a, a supplement, berberine. You can use a drug called metformin. But the main thing is, if you stop eating so many carbs, you won't keep releasing the insulin. So if you eat carbohydrates as vegetables, but not as the white vegetables, you know, like the potato, mm -hmm. and have more of the green and red and orange vegetables, you stick away from this high glycemic load that you're getting from the carbohydrates. You decrease your insulin release and you lose the belly. This is why people get abdominal you know, obesity. So people who have uh, diabetes partly have it from their diet, but partly have it from environmental exposure and inflammation. So if you find somebody uh -huh. with really bad diabetes and you go smell their basement, I can guarantee you some of the people have a very bad moldy house. Really? It's fascinating. So I because was we're saying in this country that diabetes, obesity is, is an epidemic yep. and now so is diabetes. Yep. And so, of course they're related. Yep. And also there are other toxins in, like the plastics in the bottles that we drink that are you know, feminizing, but they're also creating inflammation. I know. So I a know. friend of mine did a study on rats and he was studying pesticides. And the pesticide exposed rats got fat. Yes. And they didn't even look for that. That wasn't what they were expecting. So they published obesity caused by pesticide exposure. And now many exposures have been linked. Phthalates and other plasticizers have been linked to inflammation, creating insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes. So I was in the clinic in Dallas seeing patients with Dr. Ray. One was diabetic. She was living in a clean room with, you know, a marble floor. She said, I don't like this, this room. It's too stark. No pillows. No, you know, yeah. just everything was too, sort of hard. Four days later, after living in a clean environment, her high glucoses from her diabetes became normal. She could eat potatoes and rice, and her sugar did not go up very much. You know, it was kind of normal. And then she didn't want to go back to a hotel room that had carpeting and pillows. She loved her clean room. And her diabetes basically went away. That was it. She never became diabetic again. She stayed living in that way in the clinic. And then she made her house different without carpeting. 
and she was no longer diabetic because she had a lower toxic load, her inflammation dropped and it went away. So it's fascinating. This is shocking. It's fascinating that what you can do. So if diabetes is killing you and you care to reverse it, this is the kind of thing you do. Make an oasis bedroom, put, get the carpeting out, put oak flooring or marble in, and then boom, air filter and you start to detoxify at night instead of becoming toxic and you get better. It's fascinating, just conceptually, because I wouldn't believe it. I lived with this lady, I shared the hotel room with the lady and watched the sugars go down on her finger sticks. And then it's interesting that after the four days, she became a little more sensitive to smoke when she was cooking or to chemicals when she was outside. So it's called unmasking. And you do this with all the patients and they, you know, the severely ill patients, and they unmask and become a little more sensitive as they get well. And then they have to avoid chemicals for that first year. They have to really avoid chemicals and be careful. How do we avoid chemicals? Well, you know, if you live in a clean environment and on the vineyard, you're in good shape because the vineyard mm -hmm. has very good air. Yes. And that's why I moved here. And great water. To recover. Right. So if you've got well water and you tested it and you're okay, you know, the water in the air is pretty good. We can get organic food pretty easily. So, you know, if your air, food, and water and habitat is pretty good, then you're home free. You can start to heal. The problem is the habitats here, even, you know, the old hospital has issues with 30 years of mold, they tell me. I know. Leaks uh, and yeah. buckets in the hallways. I'm yes. not from here from 30 years ago. I've been told this. And I've been told people in various parts of the hospital have quit because they have neurologic problems and fatigue from their exposure. And, and then they've joined the new hospital with the old, which was probably not the smartest thing to have contiguous air from one to another. I would divide the two and separate and uh, not have the physicians or the CEO in the moldy portion of the hospital because they will become ill and have neurologic problems. I can guarantee it. Oh gosh, you mentioned air filters. Yeah. Tell us about air filters. Okay, so it's charcoal air filtration, mm -hmm. and usually you can't buy them in a store. You can get them at needs.com. Needs.com. Uh, I happen to sell them at the office because I have them for the patients. Mm -hmm. The two brands are Austin Air Healthmate Junior Plus. So I think it's like $419. And uh, Aerox, and that's about $349. And what it is, the cord, the rubber cord, mm -hmm. has no rubber smell. It's actually made for chemically sensitive people, these two air filters, hmm. so that if you buy it, it's not giving you that smell of rubber, which they may become sensitive to. So it says, you know, for chemically sensitive individuals, and it filters out chemical odor. So it does mold spores, it does dust, but it does chemicals. And that is how the air is cleaned because it's adsorbing to the charcoal. And then you change the, the filters like every once so a often? year. Wow. Yep. So it's really, you know, not a bad investment. If anybody has asthma, I mean, you can put it in a room with carpeting. It'll counteract the carpet and sort of make the, clean, the room cleaner while you're thinking about whether or not you'd like a hard surface floor for the child with asthma, let's say. But also, no down pillows and no down quilt. Cotton bedding is better. And if you're sensitive right. to wool, you know, you wouldn't use a wool blanket. And maybe, um, you know, dust more often, not have the stuffed animals, so many of them in the child's bedroom. Asthmatics and mothers with children with asthma have been told this by allergists for the last couple of decades. Yes. But somehow, if we give advice about the musty basement, somehow now we're touching on something that's taboo. You can talk about stuffed animals, but you can't talk about the musty basement. So it's not logical because we really can measure the toxins, measure the mold exposure through antibodies, and tell people that this is likely your issue. And, it, you know, and, okay. and put your finger on it. My, my friend with the cough when she's in the house, how does she test her house? Okay, so she does the mold plates, and she maybe does them around the house, and then watches them on the fourth or fifth day. She counts up the colonies and makes a piece of paper with how many greens, how many blues, how many blacks, and she counts. If you have a mold plate with more than four colonies, that's technically not so good if you have asthma or cough. Mm. You want less than four or less. I find that the houses on the vineyard usually have 12 colonies in an hour period. Okay, so that's the norm. Yeah. But if you've got 50 colonies and they're all a weird color, like orange or black, and they kind of look like they could be producing a toxin because they're not outside, the green ones are very common. Uh, mm -hmm. Penicillium chrysogenum is, is one that's outside a lot. So you send that in, you pay 50 to $100 to develop that mold plate at PNK Microbiology. And then when you get the result, we know what your blood test to do. It's only $6 for each mold on the blood test. Ah. So we measure the blood antibody, IgG antibody, right. to 
they named the panel after me. It's called the large Naj mold panel. So there's a small one if you don't have more than $36, and you can do a larger one if you want to spend 90 And you see who's got antibodies to molds and who doesn't. And then you can tell, oh, the husband and wife have the same antibody picture. It makes sense. They've got the same exposure. Exactly. Unless one's getting it at work and one's not. Ah, that's okay? right. So that's how you separate it. Well, thank you for describing that in oh, a yeah. way that I can understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And the audience will be able to understand what you're saying. Sure. Oh, my word. I, I know, it's a little I'm, overwhelming. <laughs> it it is overwhelming. What thoughts do you want to leave us with? Well, I think the thing I would like would be to have help um, improving the status of the situation on the vineyard with communication with the hospital with other organizations, whether it's the public health departments, uh, the building departments here, and uh, community services. Because clearly, environmental illness makes people have mental health problems. Yes. And this is the push with the VA, that the, the veterans are killing themselves because of preventable causes. And if we can get to the cause, we can prevent misery. So yes, if somebody's sick and they want to come to me as a patient, that's fine too. I take uh, Medicare and Mass Health and some other insurance plans, and I charge a little extra for the first visit because we spend hours. Mm -hmm. But after that, I accept insurance, which is not commonly done, you know, nationally. Good to know. But the main push is to change who here can help change something. Who knows somebody in the media? Who knows somebody who wants to help change policy at the AMA and has a friend they can call? to get them to sit down with me and talk politics at AMA. Who knows somebody in a Senate office who really wants to help write the bill that we're trying to do on veterans' health care or change policy on GMO food labeling? People have to take matters into their own hands, and we cannot just imbibe psychiatric medication and go let people go down the tubes. It's just it's really unconscionable that we are not allowed to get the information out. For example, I want to write a weekly article or a monthly article in the newspaper to let people know about the benefits of vitamin D or the downside of a moldy home or the benefits of uh, some easy thing people can do without going to a doctor to stay well. Right, but getting they the have, word out. Yeah, they have the veterinarian yes. getting a, a weekly, yeah, and I pitched this years ago and in fact just getting an article in the paper about the national movement is very difficult because of the, the belief at the newspapers that this is controversial. Well, I would say, guy damn it, if something's controversial, it's usually correct. <laughs> and we should have support from the media, as we are from MVTV, to help people know how they can assist by writing, having more frequent articles in the newspapers. I would love to see a at least monthly article in the newspapers and local newspapers. Can I write to the papers and say that that's what I would like to have? Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. Just, you know, I don't know if I want to do it every week anyway because it's a little exhausting. That's, yes, it is. And I write for blogs and that kind of thing. But I think if we had a monthly section on um, integrative and environmental health and people could even ask a question, what do I do for this? And, you know, yes. I could answer the question. And then that way people would learn from each other on the vineyard what their health issues are and, and what the suggested regimen would be to make it better. Or anything that we think is topical and political we want to discuss in the paper. Just a venue. Because it shouldn't be that what I say and environmental medicine has to say, I am on the board of the Academy of Environmental Medicine, by the way, needs to be sanctioned by every doctor at the hospital, right? Why do we all have to agree? I may be correct and they may be incorrect, but they're actually treating people, let's say with psychiatric medicine, and I don't. And one doctor confronted me and said, I'm not a psychiatrist, how dare I treat these people? But I'm not writing psych drugs. I'm, right. Right, so, <laughs> so, and they are, and they're GPs. So the injustice is really saying what's the norm should continue instead of saying we're ready Ready well, for some change. It's hard for people to embrace change. And it's great to feel well. I mean, I, I think that it's well, really... Well, that's persuasive. <laughs> yeah. No, because I feel good all the time, and I really feel that other people deserve, you know, this. And I was horrible when I was sick, you know, very depressed, and had no idea that I had Addison's disease and dysautonomia. And it took me a long time to piece it all together. So I take a few hormones and a couple of supplements, and I am 
totally well, all the time, not chemically sensitive, really better than I ever thought I could have been. So I'm the poster child for <laughs> the, the very words I treatment. was just going to say. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. This has been fascinating, and I think you've given us a lot to think about. I'd like to pursue a couple of things myself. I'm going to see if I can talk to somebody at the newspapers. To I have no influence in the hospital at all, but you're going to work on that, right? Well, somebody watching the show may be able to explain, you know, to people like the CEO of the hospital or others, that we should be working in tandem and really doing what we can to benefit Islanders, not yes. to stop the information, to benefit the status quo when really it's time, time to change things because the public wants it, so healthcare has to deliver it now. Wow. You know? Well, you've given us a lot to think about. I, I am so glad you came in, and I I'd like to follow up with this. Let's talk again, and, and maybe even another few months, okay. and see if there have been any changes. And thank you so much for giving us all things that we can think about, things that we might be able to change in our lives. And the idea of journaling and doing our own experimentation in terms Together. of how things affect us. And the last thing I was going to mention is that either this time or another time, I've got some testimonial videotapes from patients who want to put it on YouTube. So I have the authorization to put it on this channel. And I have a young girl who felt much better after she was treated, and I treated both of her siblings. One of them worked for me, actually, as a secretary, and then the other ones had to become patients. They all had mold exposure, and even though it took three or four years to, to get hold of each one, it's really important when somebody is a teenager and is suicidal mm. to prevent mm. them from killing themselves. And I think watching the testimonial from the patient or two would really be helpful for people to understand this is a big deal. There are important political figures who have this, and maybe we can discuss next time who's got it, who did kill themselves from this kind of thing, and we need to prevent the deaths by taking action soon. Okay, we're going to follow up on this. Thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate it very much, and I'm sure the audience will as well. Thanks very much. This has been The Vineyard View. I'm your host, Ann Bassett, saying keep your eye on MVTV and think very, very carefully about what's around us, what toxins may be affecting us. Give some thought to environmental medicine because it affects all of us. Thank you.